Welcome back to another episode of the Level Up podcast. Uh, today, our guest is uh, an ex-Olympic uh, athlete, two times, um, uh, competing in synchronized swimming uh, in Sydney and in Athens Olympics. Uh, you are also the winner of the Women's Health uh, Next Fitness Star uh, competition, uh, runner-up for Educator of the Year 2023 uh, at the Reps uh, Industry Awards. Hiba. Hi. Mina. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me today. No, thank you for coming. And uh, that's that's actually uh, quite a great uh, resume. But uh, I, I got to know you from uh, Body Hack. So you are the co-founder of uh, Body Hack. So uh, maybe we can uh, first touch on your uh, upbringing journey, like being an athlete, and then we can take it uh, more towards how you came up with uh, Body Hack. Wonderful, yeah, sure. So basically, I um, I was a synchronized swimmer for many years. It was my whole life, mm -hmm. um, as you say. Uh, it was um, uh, one of these sports that was quite popular in Egypt. I'm mm -hmm. half Egyptian, and I grew up in Egypt. And uh, basically, um, it's it's a very demanding sport that requires usually eight hours a day. We used to go before school, after school, before uni, after uni. Um, and uh, I felt that in Egypt, we were training a lot uh, compared to other countries that are ranking much higher. And I, the reason I got into studying sports science and I, I wanted to After, after I finished the Athens Olympics, I wanted to go study sports science because I wanted to understand more about the factors that affect performance. I wanted to understand how is it that we are, like we say in Put, Arabic, putting, too much, yeah, putting and, too much yeah, hours into putting training. Ridiculous amount of hours in training, ridiculous amount of effort. Uh, we're winning, all, almost all the sports in Egypt seem to be winning at the junior level. Mm -hmm. Like we were winning the Russians, the Canadians, and then we kind of just stay at that level. And I noticed in the Olympics that all of them were saying the exact same stories. All of the Egypt athletes were saying, yeah, in juniors we used to win. And then we just plateaued mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And then everybody started to, to leap and, you know, to, to get ahead of us. And and that's really what wanted, that made me want to study sports science. And then after going to the UK, studying sports science and studying with various other different routes in fitness, we moved to Dubai, my husband and I, in 2012 and that's when we set up uh, body hack uh, fitness education because we were already teaching certifications in the uk actually mm -hmm. and then we uh we decided to to do that uh, here in the in the region so awesome. that, that's kind of how it started awesome and and um, uh, speaking of um, uh, starting body hack so uh, w w when it comes to the the name and the combination like I, i do love the way even that you write body hack body double slash oh. hack so so how, how did you come with the idea or the brand I'm really glad you said that because we kind of stopped doing it because people used to get frustrated with the full stop and the dashes. And um, my husband's the one who, who came up with that. His, his brain is wired a bit differently. Uh, but basically, he um, we we had studied uh, functional neurology with various different companies, mm -hmm. which I know now in the biohacking world is has become very popular. But at the time, was we started studying uh, applied neuroscience in 2008 in Phoenix, Arizona with the health performance. And then we were studying with the neuroscience stuff with various other companies. And it's all about... Um, Not not necessarily like not necessarily taking a shortcut, but there's a more efficient way to do things if you target the CEO of the body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's instead of just someone's got this posture, instead of just stretching these muscles and strengthening these muscles, how can we communicate with the actual cerebellum, the mid portion of the cerebellum that controls our posture, that sends the signals down to make to to send a better signal to actually change his posture? So that's where the kind of word hack uh, came from, body hack. Mm -hmm. Now I know the word hack has negative connotations and very kind of the biohacking world maybe has come into a lot of scrutiny. Uh, so I don't know if it's still a good name for us and whether we should change it because we are very evidence-based. I mean, we are very uh, research-based in our approach. We don't ever make claims that this will do this for you unless it's actually backed up by evidence. And and again, we, we definitely stay within our scope of practice as fitness professionals without stepping out of it. So, um, so yeah, for now, we still have the, the name and... 
And I'm glad you like the, the I, branding. I, I do. Sorry. I do like it. And and again, I'm I'm, I'm coming from technology. So for me, hacking uh, the uh, one one notion about it as well is that there's ethical hacking. Yes. So it's uh, it's, yeah. it's 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 kind of it's it's not a bad word, right? As long as we 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 know how to use it uh, the right way. Uh, and I, I I love the idea that you're you're trying to tap into the brain and try to see how it uh, can function better to to help uh, people perform better. Um, Ethical hacking. Sorry, when you mentioned that, I remember we got hacked last year in uh, Instagram, lost all of our followers. Yes. And that was the first time I came across the concept of ethical hackers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many approached us actually to uh, to get our account. And they couldn't at the end mm -hmm. get our account back. <laughs> I don't know why it was so complicated. But I've heard a lot of people get their accounts back with the ethical hackers. Yeah, is, yeah, uh, they do. Um, th 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 there was this um, uh, podcast I did um, a couple of months back with uh, Tanner uh, Shock. So he had a very uh, strong Instagram and he lost everything. Did he? Oh, I didn't. I follow yes. him. And and the way he uh, he uh, got it back was actually by uh, hiring an uh, ethical hacker. Uh, he said he's going to send me the contact, so I'm, I'm holding you up to this. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so there there are ways uh, to get it back. But uh, uh, yeah, anyways, I, I, I do remember I, I did I did um, uh, notice when uh, the Instagram went down uh, or disappeared, and then you posted a story. It was very uh, uh, touching about like uh, how your um, because you depend on Instagram. Like these days, I Completely. think for businesses, you have to depend on social media in, in getting the presence out and getting your leads and getting people to get to know what you do. Uh, and losing all of that, losing all the contacts is, is quite a bummer. But um, I think you're doing good now. Uh, in, in one year, we managed to get 6,000 something, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is not bad, I, th I heard. Uh, I'm not sure, but our definitely, uh, I couldn't believe how much we relied on Instagram ads and Facebook ads and how that would be affected by the number of followers. Mm -hmm. Like really the inquiries were significantly down, even though we were spending the same amount on the ads as we were before, the reach was totally different yeah. and the quality of leads was totally different. And I had no idea that our number of followers would affect that. And it really did. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's the way uh, Meta works. So uh, it really depends on who are following you and, and that's why like it, it's really important never buy followers because the the quality of followers that you have will result in a better uh, conversion when it comes to the ads because uh, uh, instagram and facebook would understand who your target audience is based on who's actually engaging with your content and accordingly when you start posting an ad whether you're spending the same amount or even less it knows who to target this ad to and, uh, and and that's why, of course, losing uh, that uh, amount. And, and I believe um, you, you had a good engagement also on social media. So that's why your ads were performing better than before. Uh, but you're back on track now, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, now, now in the last month or so, mm -hmm. our digital marketing guy did something and mm -hmm. the quality of leads is, uh, is Getting feels better like now. it used to be. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's we good. We used to get before that just people asking for jobs. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. Just all the time wasting time answering inquiries of people just wanting jobs with us. Um, maybe something in our adverts. I'm not sure. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things actually, and it's not actually part of the topics that we're discussing, which yeah. is which is quite cool. Um, uh, one of the things I noticed is that you're you're putting a lot of effort also on the content that you're pro uh, uh, providing on social media. So you're doing video content, which I think. It's, it's the way to go uh, these days. Um, what, what, what's your thought process or how, how, how do you come up with the ideas or how? We actually hired a company after we got hacked because mm -hmm. we never, we never, we just used to post whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's mostly me just posting things from the group classes and uh, what we were teaching. Mm -hmm. But uh, after we got hacked, we thought, well, we better take this seriously now. And we hired a um, a social media company called Donut Media. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, we meet with them once a month and do shoots. I try to get the rest of the team, but they're all freelancers, most of them, who mm -hmm. are super busy because they're just amazing trainers. And uh, it ends up being mostly me. That's why I'm flooding our accounts <laughs> because I'm there. And we've got all these shoots that we're, you know, signed a contract for. Mm -hmm. But I, most of them are just me talking. So, um, so they kind of give us a rough outline of why do you do a, a post about this? Then I kind of write 
a rough draft and then they make it more catchy like they'll say okay that's quite boring mm -hmm. where's the hook mm -hmm. uh, the hook needs to be sh snappier shorter mm -hmm. and then we kind of just on whatsapp and calls back and forth until it's a bit more um ready for actually shooting and some of the best ones have just been on the fly in the moment honestly yeah. just uh, organic uh, no not too much thought behind I, it i i i believe so as well because um, uh, the idea Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if uh, this is the right perspective or the right way to put it, but I, I, I do believe that it, it, you're always told that when you get to create content, you have to put the right hook, the right meat mm. for the content, and then the right uh, call to action. Uh, and it has to be snappy, it has to be fast, because the attention span of people is very short. People are just scrolling on the phone. You want to catch them in the first uh, two seconds or in the first 10 seconds where they understand the message and then they want to continue the video. Uh, yet, uh, I, I got a feel that sometimes now it's becoming too much. Yeah, Like uh, totally. uh, 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 content now on, on social media is becoming too well prepared. Yeah, well, I think Kanye West <laughs> kind of just totally changed that with the yeah. Super Bowl ad. Um, I mean, I think that that ad that he put up is going to change social media now for a long time because yes. because people want real, people want just more spontaneous, more, more real, rough more and, just you. Yeah, and and actually, um, that's that's exactly what we spoke about with the uh, with the with company the yeah. is to make it less. Um, less edited less uh you know uh, the videos i mean more more just uh, kind of rougher mm -hmm. um and i think maybe that will make people engage a bit more i'm not yeah. sure we'll yeah i i, I do believe so but, but again it's trial and error we, yeah, we have yeah. to try and and there's no uh, formula for uh, what content gets the uh, engagement or what content gets to go viral Uh, I think it's uh, it's more trial and error and, and trying out and seeing what works. Yeah, exactly. And diversifying because that's yeah. something we were speaking about is our videos are very same samey, mm -hmm. uh, lots of tips because they, they tend to do better on the numbers. But I think if you diversify the content and even if you put like some because uh, before I used to say, let's do some moves. Mm -hmm. And then they tell me, but they, they don't do very well. Those those uh, posts, only the tips do well. Yeah. But then if you do, if you diversify a little bit and you put some other things, then the tips shine bet shine more. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's just too much tips all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite important to, well, we'll yet to find out, actually. We're gonna see. I, I, I agree. I, you have to try. You yeah. have to try. It's, it's, uh, it's a journey. Yeah. As well. uh, awesome. So um, uh, for those who don't know you and for those who are watching for the first time so we were talking about body hack and we talked about the brand and the name and everything what is body hack uh, so now body hack is a fitness education company that only does certifications certifications for people who want to enter the industry or people who are already in the industry and want to specialize in different areas of the uh, of the industry but uh, Before, when we first started, we were actually doing a bit of everything, personal training company where we send trainers to different homes. And then the education was the education was only on the weekends, mm -hmm. but then it became so, there was so much demand for good quality education here in the region that we, the minute we decided to go full time, full on education. that's when we really started to expand and we really felt the growth within Body Hack is when we gave up, sadly, all of our clients, my husband and mm. I, because we had some really, you know, clients that by that point felt like family, mm -hmm. you know, it was really sad to, um, to kind of break up mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but looking back now, it was 100% the right decision because there was no way we would have been able to, to grow in the way that we did if we hadn't done that. That's uh, that's awesome. And, and actually, speaking of this, and and um, uh, coaches, I I believe these days, uh, uh, first of all, there, there is a struggle, of course, of getting the client right. So so getting out there, getting to uh, to be in the gym floor, or getting on social media and getting the clients. But I feel also one of the biggest uh, struggles coaches have right now as well is retention. Uh, of clients and and you're saying that it was actually hard but you had to take the decision to part way with uh, your clients uh, on the contrary i'm thinking okay but other coaches are actually struggling to just keep the clients for longer and longer so what's what's the magic or what's what's the magic formula here i think is a lot of trainers just get too familiar with the clients that mm -hmm. they, that professional boundary gets lost mm -hmm. and when it turns to friendshipy 
the coaching stops happening. I think people just start appearing to say, this is what I see all the time with our graduates. They come to the session, they're chatting about life the whole time. Um, the professionalism and the dedication and the care and the organization of, of the programming, of the following up, that gets lost the more familiar people are. And then I think the client starts to realize, well, I really don't need to be paying for uh, you know, a friend. Just a common chat. Uh, or, yeah. yeah. And I see that so often in the in the industry. And I remember it's so tempting mm -hmm. as a trainer to 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 blur those borders and to start to 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 really just chat for the entire session because we have so much in common. And most trainers are really good communicators and they're really good socially. And I think that um, I don't know if that's the sole reason, uh, honestly, mm -hmm. but uh, I just see it happening at a lot. And I remember the feeling very much. Oh, I need to. I need to let's let, try to cut this conversation so we can really so I can actually coach and I can and, and I really need to to keep the the professional boundaries with payments and all of that very clear and cancellations and policies and all that from the beginning and continuing mm -hmm. uh, onwards with uh, with uh, with no exceptions I imagine yeah so so it has to be uh, there the the borderline is there it's very clear and then uh, uh, because um, Maybe I, I, I believe the trick uh, would be that uh, personal training as well, uh, uh, um, and, and this is a discussion I was having in my, my last podcast, I, I feel there's a kind of a difference between just personal training and coaching because uh, you're preparing coaches and, and, and they have to be uh, having this social aspect or this psychological aspect as well to try to understand more about uh, their clients uh, uh, way of living and what they're doing and how to tap into uh, different habits and try to help them change the habits so there is a lot of personal touch uh, yes in there. 100% and that personal touch I mean it has to be within the, the boundaries of being also professional mm -hmm. but I always tell our students you want to make the client feel like we are going to the fitness Olympics, you know, mm -hmm. and I want, I am your coach and I care about every aspect of your life to make you get there. Like that, that, that kind of care that's so genuine mm -hmm. that you have to get into as a, you know, like you say, coach is different from trainer. Mm -hmm. And once you change your mindset to, I am a uh, coach and we are going to compete together and we have our set goals and we have our plan for the year and we have you know this this makes the client feel like this is more than just someone because now with AI and everything you know people can get workouts uh, anywhere that are way better than some of the stuff we come up with right yeah. and they're really well you know they're well really structured well, well written structured yeah. in, in no time you can get amazing pl nutrition plans amazing programs so really it's like you say it's that social touch and that feeling of I care mm -hmm. and we are doing this together and I'm holding you know, we're both holding each other accountable because it's my job and 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 it's also your I'm pretending you're my client <laughs> yeah, now yeah, yeah. and we're we're going uh, to compete together and I think that makes a big difference even in classes you know we certify Pilates instructors all the time and mm -hmm. you know you see one class after another and and they're just going through script mm -hmm. rather than really really caring and being present in the moment it takes takes a lot of kind of, I don't know, um, mental strategy to try stay fresh and caring with each mm -hmm. client without going into autopilot. Mm -hmm. It's a struggle with uh, I, uh, Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's actually part of the... Um, so so when, we're, when you're talking about being an educational institute, um, how, how do you prepare... Uh, a certified personal trainer like what's what's the curriculum like is it is it more like um just learning the moves learning the anatomy of the body learning about nutrition so how, how do you take or how do you take someone who's coming in to become a certified personal trainer uh, through a journey to actually become a really certified personal trainer yeah uh, it's uh, it's a difficult one actually, and one that we battled with a lot. When we started with fitness education, we wanted people to do these uh, kind of one year long programs mm -hmm. uh, because that's really how long it a, a minimum it takes to actually feel uh, proficient in getting into the industry, right? Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, 
Sadly, that would never have worked. We've heard of companies who tried to do that, and it just it's just too much of an expensive affair for learners. It's too long a journey. Nobody, we will, will not get any signups. Even reps told us that long, uh, one year long program people have tried and failed. Didn't work. Um, mm. So now the program lasts about four months. Uh, which, of course, for many would see, find too short, but we emphasize all the time when they graduate, this is the beginning, mm -hmm. the beginning of the journey. It's not the, it's not the, now I'm certified and I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Now is where the real learning starts, is when you're actually going out there and getting clients and working on the gym, in the gym. So uh, you asked about the curriculum, sorry, and I went to the end <laughs> part, but let's, the, the beginning is... Uh, basically a screening that we do. Because one of the biggest issues that we found is that people are coming on our courses, particularly after COVID, I don't know why, and they've never stepped foot in a gym before. Okay. So um, why they decided to become trainers is more out of necessity, coming trying to get out of a low-paying job where fitness actually pays better. Mm -hmm. um, or just, I think I can do this because it looks easy. Mm -hmm. And and learning how to squat and deadlift for the first time in the practical days when the practical days are structured to really focus on coaching mm -hmm. not on okay we take people through the technique but of course we assume that this is in their bones mm -hmm. already you mm -hmm. know but it um, sadly sadly we learned the hard way and that you know the the face-to-face -face days which we we, do, we run eight face-to-face -face days and the rest is online theory videos and webinars and things like that so those eight face-to-face -face days are nowhere near enough mm -hmm. they're spread out over two months and then the remainder two months they do their theory it's nowhere near enough for someone who's not been living and breathing fitness mm -hmm. so now we're screening people before they join to just ask the basic questions are you used to lifting weights and and through the conversation you can kind of tell if they have been uh, lifting at least or mm -hmm. not, because that's a big part of the course. So um, so the tutors are saying that the, the quality of students coming to the course now are actually more experienced and, and that everybody's uh, doing better because of it. So after the screening, they start with their anatomy and physiology and they learn that and then they do gym instructing and then they do personal training and they, the program obviously consists of basic nutrition, mm -hmm. not super in-depth. They would still need to specialize in nutrition, in nutrition if, if they, they wanted want to. to mm. uh, they would still need to do further study. But, you know, the basic stuff about calculations and healthy eating advice and all that is covered in the course. And uh, programming and habit change, of course, the basics of that is uh, the programming is more emphasized. Habit change and the business of personal training is quite brief. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking to make that more in depth in our programs because we feel that that's really important. There's a need. Yep. So we're adding more theory videos on habit change and more theory videos on uh, the business side of personal training. And I believe that what makes our diploma stand out in the industry is our online platform actually mm -hmm. because this is the feedback we're getting from students who have done their training elsewhere whether it's in other countries or whether it's in the uae our online platform which has all the lecture videos we filmed ourselves mm -hmm. with our best teachers and the thing with getting it outsourced from the states or the uk which is where the training the awarding bodies are coming from is it's very much taught for those markets but in the uae we're teaching the entire world there's language barriers, there's ways that you need to teach that simplify the language and make it super dynamic. Like mm -hmm. when I'm teaching on the online videos, I'm not just talking at people, I'm asking the, the person to stand so up, mm -hmm. I'm asking them to do these moves with me and can you feel this? And, and the feedback we get is that it's really like face-to-face -face learning, mm -hmm. uh, if not better, because they can actually pause and watch and, again. And, and go back to it and, yeah, and repeat. And the, yeah. And the, all the videos are offered in Arabic as well, so you can choose English or Arabic. Now we've added new videos with subtitles, and nice. um, that seems to be, I think, the the way people like to learn now more than Zoom. Mm -hmm. Zoom sometimes gets tiring with the. And and uh, uh, as as I understand, you, you do operate actual physical um, um, uh, classes uh, in UAE in Egypt. Uh, where else? Uh, Oman. Oman, uh, Saudi, 
and South Korea. South Korea. So, so you do have the the presence to to have students from those different uh, areas, as well as students from all around the world who can just take the online if they want to have the physical classes. They have to just fly in to one of those destinations. Yeah, they've been doing. Uh, we've recently had a lot of people doing that. I'm not sure why, because those countries all have certifications, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they think that if they do a certification in the UAE, they're going to get a job in the UAE. Mm -hmm. But actually, I, you know, we're always honest with people who are uh, uh, who are calling in. You know, Dubai is expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, you come here for the practicals for three weeks. Uh, I always I always mention actually in your country you have this this and this which is internationally recognized. Mm -hmm. But they still think that that coming over studying with us because because we have a good reputation here they they think they have a higher chance of getting a a job whether that's true or not um, I'm not sure but um, it's happening for sure. Cool, awesome, yeah. awesome. And um, uh, you, w when you do certify your uh, your uh, students they they got diplomas so there is active IQ. Yes, Active IQ is our awarding body. Okay. And the reason we've gone for a British awarding body is they um, they're very good on quality assurance. Mm -hmm. Like we get, we have our inspection this weekend. Okay. We flew in from Fly the UK into. to come inspect us. We have to submit a ton of paperwork. I've been drowning in paperwork this whole week just for our inspection, and and it, it keeps everybody on their toes. The whole team, you know, we have to send video assessments as well of of assessments that are being done so that it's fair to the student. There's there's laws and appeals procedure in case the student doesn't agree with the outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, things that I'm not sure if if the um, other awarding bodies have or don't have, but this is what we got used to. We used to live mm -hmm. there. And I like these this heavy Procedures. quality assurance. Yeah. It's a headache for the center, but at the end, make sure that we don't get complacent and mm -hmm. we are still, you know, uh, making sure the learner is getting the best experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. And um, uh, when I was going through the website, um, there was a mention that you do also um, a diploma or, or you have a, a, a curriculum for uh, neuropilatus. Yes. So what is neuro pilates? So that's kind of my uh, my thing, mm -hmm. which I really want to focus on in this coming period because um, it's it's starting to to grow a lot internationally mm -hmm. in the Pilates community. Um, neuro pilates is basically because because my I used to teach um, Pilates classes in the UK, mm -hmm. mostly older clients, mm -hmm. sixty plus, right? Mm -hmm. And then I went and studied with Z Health. Uh, in uh, in the U.S. in Phoenix, and I started to blend all these neurological exercises into my Pilates classes. So when I left the U.K. and came to uh, Dubai, all the ladies that were coming to my classes they would message me and send emails and saying we miss neuro Pilates. Mm -hmm. uh, the te the new teacher is amazing, but we really miss the high exercises, the the, the joint feet things we used mm -hmm. to do, the nerve uh, stretches we used to do, and uh, and they're the ones who called it neuro Pilates first. And then I thought, well, we're starting this body hack thing, we're starting mm -hmm. the teacher training. Why don't I start uh, delivering this neuro Pilates education, which is taking what I've learned from the amazing companies of the neuroscience, but really applying it to Pilates. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of how, how we integrate, every, every Pilates class is themed towards a different part of the brain. And the whole point is to improve brain health. I mean, everything improves brain health, all sport, all movement, all great coaches. By default, making people better movers makes people improve their brain health. Mm -hmm. But the way we do it is very specific with specific assessments. If you come to me for a session, I would check, do a whole bunch of assessments to see what parts of your brain may be overworking, may be underworking, and what can I do as a movement professional to help stimulate those areas that are overworking or inhibit the areas that are, uh, or, uh, the, sorry, stimulate that are underworking. And uh, you, you get what I mean. Yep. Uh, through, the, through the Pilates exercises, integrating those neural ones in it. So... Um, now in Korea, this is really expanded. Or that's why I travel a lot to Korea. I've got the Pilates in Asia conference that I'm presenting on in May, and then I'm going to Japan to present on this as well right after. And it's really growing uh, in Asia specifically, mm -hmm. but also we're getting a lot of signups from the U.S. Uh, since we got the accreditation for it from um, from the um, uh, U.S. accreditations, and now now it's uh, it's starting to to increase. Um, 
you know, the interest of neuroscience is increasing in every profession, that's, but that's, in fitness as well. That's awesome. But um, I'll, 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 I'll take you a bit back with some basics, right? So if, if I'm looking at personal training, regular coaching, right? Uh, in order for me to assess a result of a personal trainer, I would like to see uh, body recomposition or yes. I'd like to see uh, weight loss transformations. For neuropilatus, how do you measure success? How, yeah. how do you uh, see that, okay, you worked on someone, you, you applied some practices, how do you see the result of that? I love that you asked that because people always think the neuro stuff is for rehabilitation only okay. and getting out of pain. They always think that. And that's, you know, to be honest, most of the clients I was getting were people with Parkinson's, MS. Now all of our neuro instructors in Egypt are getting people with conditions mm -hmm. because they associate neuropilates with, oh, that's for the neuro uh, stroke rehab and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's actually for everything. If I want, if I want to lose weight... I need to convince my brain that it's safe to lose weight because all your brain cares about is survival. So in terms of fat loss or body composition goals, you still need to study the nervous system in depth. You still need to know what are the barriers that are inhibiting that habit change or that, that decision-making process about food choice, for example. I need to take down those barriers, take the brakes off the body, and the only way I can do that is by getting to know this overprotective parent in my skull, I'm saying overprotective because it so often is, mm -hmm. our brain is so often putting the brakes on everything about us just because it doesn't trust us. Mm -hmm. And as a coach, as a personal trainer, I need to build trust between the brain and the body. That is my number one goal always because I can't get to any of the client's goals without improving that brain-body communication. And the way to improve the brain-body communication is you, Mina, if you're my client, I need to make you a better survivor. And I cannot make you a better survivor unless I get to know mm -hmm. what your deficits are, where are your weaknesses. And I need to know the biomechanical weaknesses, the brain weaknesses that affect decision making and food choice, all that stuff, and uh, everything that is putting the brakes on your body. So, uh, sorry, I didn't really answer your question. I did, but how do I measure? Uh, success in the neuropilates because they keep coming for rehab mostly. Mm -hmm. It's about seeing whether that client's getting out of pain in the long term. Um, just so happens that we seem to be attracting those, our graduates, I mean, seem to be yeah. attracting those kind of clients and whether their function with Parkinson's has improved, even though there's no cure obviously for it, there's no cure for MS, but doing neuropilates with these clients is keeping them in a certain stage of the disease for mm -hmm. a longer period. Whether we know that to be a fact, that it is the neuropilates that is doing that, who knows, right? We never But at least any... you're seeing the results. You're, you're seeing you're the seeing... results from, from what the clients are saying. I mm -hmm. mean, the clients are saying what you're seeing. You're seeing their flexibility improve. You're seeing their gait improve, their uh, strength improve, because we measure everything, right? Mm -hmm. The eyes, we take videos of their eyes. The eyes are the window into the brain. When I'm waving a pen in front of your eyes, I'm not looking really at your eyes. I'm mm -hmm. looking at what are your eye movements telling me about the different structures in the brain that affect this, 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 and this, right? So as I take a video of your eyes, I take another video of your eyes eight weeks later, and that's how I know, look, look at the difference, how smooth this eye movement is, how choppy this one is. And you can see that the neuronal function is also improving. improving. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's quite um, uh, a lot of different tests and re you can only retest to know if what you I, 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 I just think that, uh, it's uh, uh, like you were saying, it's, it's attracting a certain client. It's attracting a certain uh, uh, person who's, who's looking into this. Uh, and it's going to be a hard sell, I imagine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, with conditions, it's a very easy sell, right? Yeah. But my husband, for example, is working with tons of athletes, mm -hmm. uh, Beijing Ducks, Stefan Marbury, you know, all from the neuro training that we did. If it wasn't for the neuro training that he did, you wouldn't have gotten these opportunities. Mm -hmm. So in, in the world of sport and in the world of rehab, neuroscience is already massive and it's been around a long time. Vision training is not so alien. Mm -hmm. It's the fitness in the middle, that kind of personal training gym world where it's still very new. Yeah. But, you know, in the physio world and in the sports world, it's, 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 it's very, been there. Yeah, for a long time. We're not, we're not saying anything new or revolutionary. Nice. nice. Awesome. And um, so um, um, 
go going back to you, right? So um, uh, you've been an athlete yourself. You've um, uh, uh, participated in two Olympics, which which I think it's it's uh, quite an achievement. Just just being there, traveling and and uh, representing your your country and and, and doing uh, sport on a global stage uh, like the Olympics. Uh, tell me about the the journey itself. Like, how was the experience? How was Uh, being there competing with like top level athletes from all around the world. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And our goal was really just to qualify. So we are nowhere near podium <laughs> <laughs> level. Uh, our ranking is quite low when you look at the um, uh, like uh, the actual ranking, but they don't people don't know that just to qualify is such a big deal. Yeah. So for us just to reach 18th place or 20th place is such a big uh, thing in the pre-qualifier because when we go in April, uh, in April and both times we went in April for the pre-qualifier and then mm -hmm. the Olympics was in August, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that was the big achievement, not the Olympics itself, the pre-qualifier. So just being, now it's different because now Africa gets, uh, in, in our sport anyway, you get a free spot. Okay. So now Egypt is a given because we're top in Africa. Mm -hmm. We get a spot by default. Mm -hmm. But in our days, <laughs> you really you had, had to, to fight for it. Actually <laughs> qualify. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was such a big uh, achievement for us. And, um, and basically, um, the event itself, the Global Village is just a crazy place. Um, super you know, inspiring to see all these different athletes. And that's when you realize, you know, you can really guess which sport people are from, from their structure and their build. Mm -hmm. And you see why these top athletes make it. It's really not just hard work. It's, it's a lot to do with structure. And, uh, and I always think that there is a place for, or there should be a business. Because when we used to travel to Russia for camps, mm -hmm. These little kids were, they were being measured their torso to their femur length, to their ankle uh, uh, radius, to mm -hmm. their flexibility and their connective tissue. Everything is measured from when they're very young to see whether you're wasting time putting your kid in on, this on sport. On a sport or not. Wow. Yeah, I really think that because we teach some of that too. Like there's definitely, definitely, why would you put your kid in swimming if they have small hands and small feet? You know, mm. they've got, of course... I'm not making excuses. Everybody can work hard and get there. Mm -hmm. But to, to reach Michael Phelps' level, you have to have some structural things that are to your advantage as well. Mm -hmm. So I do think that the structure was a big eye-opener. Mm -hmm. Like uh, in, the, in the Olympics, it was very clear that different sports had different structures. Whether they're just born like that or whether the training made them, that's a whole big debate. Mm -hmm. um, But also just, it was interesting to me to see, you know, you have all this food that you can possibly imagine for free in the food tents, which were everywhere around the village. Mm -hmm. And still, most of the athletes queuing up at McDonald's. Like, you know, interesting. you okay. have the, all the cuisines you can possibly imagine mm -hmm. in, in the whole uh, village. And, and McDonald's was definitely <laughs> worth the, the queue. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting. And, and just we emphasize so much about nutrition in sport. Mm -hmm. Whether athletes that are at that level are actually taking their nutrition seriously didn't seem to be so for me. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> that's that's interesting. That's interesting. But, but but I do imagine maybe they were queuing after they finished their sport itself. No, no, so, the so they, time, they were like no. recovering or <laughs> I don't know. The, from day one, there's queues at McDonald's and all these are stands are empty with just amazing food. Um, but yeah, I mean, we all know nutrition is important. Of but, course, yeah. You know, uh, I wonder if if they did take their nutrition seriously, how that might affect their performance even more. I mm -hmm. don't know. Maybe times have changed now. This was, you know, 2004 and 2008, yeah. so yeah. a long while back. That's uh, that's so cool. And um, um, you were the Women's Health uh, Magazine Next uh, Fitness Star. Can, can you tell me a bit about this uh, journey as well? Or that like was how, just how? a fun competition that... Uh -huh. um, Uh, some of us entered it, because the, the reward was pretty cool. The mm -hmm. reward was, and I know it Be, being on the cover of the magazine or yeah, and but but actually uh, they're producing your video, and I've always mm -hmm. wanted to produce a video at the time. Now I know it's it's a totally different world we live in, right? Yeah. But at the time, producing an exercise video like a Jane Fonda video yeah, or whatever yeah. was so expensive. I had already looked into it, and it was so expensive that uh, when I saw that the prize was that, of course I. 
applied. Applied for it, yeah. And uh, there was already some big influencers in the thing, and I was a nobody, but mm -hmm. um, my Egypt <laughs> community mm -hmm. came in that I'm always so grateful for uh, because uh, it was a voting competition. Mm -hmm. And you know Egyptians, yeah, right? Yeah, so we, we support each other back to back. the network was crazy. <laughs> I had my sisters mm -hmm. uh, posting, my friends. And when when I won, the, the person who called me she said, your voting was just nowhere near these other, the other uh, you know, big athletes. names yeah. in the industry. But it was just uh, the Egypt thing, mm -hmm. really. Our <laughs> culture cool. is like that. So I That's really cool. don't know if I deserve to win, but they, mm -hmm. the you know, that, that kind of culture we brought up in is uh, such a big network there. Awesome. Yeah. And um, being the, the educator that you are, and, and you have been doing this for, for quite some time now, um, Where do you see fitness is going? Like uh, any, um, um, is it is it a trendy industry? Like you get to see trends uh, show up and then die, and then other trends come and go. Like yeah, always. It's like waves. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, yeah. You. so so I, I I wanted actually to get your take on that. Like where where do you see fitness in going? What's the next trend uh, when it comes to fitness? Um, AI generated fitness for sure. Mm -hmm. Although I'm very not against <laughs> We it. were just yeah, talking yeah. about my yeah. ignorance of how <laughs> amazing ChatGPT is. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, uh, AI generated fitness for sure is is something that even though I don't know enough about, I can see clearly that, that is, everything's going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Even at Beyond Active in Riyadh, there was everything talking about AI this and that. Um, so it seems like that's going to be a, a huge thing in every industry, not just obviously fitness. Uh, but uh, Pilates now is again, it shows that, you know, things don't just come up and down. They mm -hmm. go in waves, right? Pilates mm -hmm. now, we can't keep up Pick with up. the number of signups. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot. Pilates is um, really back in fashion now in a big way, mm -hmm. particularly reformer uh, Pilates, which is the, you know, the, the machine. The, the machine, yeah. And um Uh, where we obviously uh, we do have prerequisites for people b doing that but uh, yeah i'm not sure really where the trend is going but definitely the social aspect uh, anything that builds uh, community and the feeling of um, that social aspect that people are missing mm -hmm. from the ai stuff i think that's going to be a big thing like now what seems to be really popular is these nightclub looking pilates places which mm -hmm. is a bit unheard of mm -hmm. for more traditional um pilates, pilates world yeah. and how we studied and now when i go to these places it's very strange to me that the mm -hmm. that there is no natural light it's all nightclubby the music is loud there's mm -hmm. my, we never used to play music in a pilates class you know so this kind of But you can see the community and the energy is like, uh, you know, I'm not going to judge it because yeah. whatever gets people moving is a good thing, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at that and seeing is this is this the the trend now with like berries and all these kind of things also coming up, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or they've been around actually for a while, but. But yeah, I, I, I feel so, and I feel actually it's uh, uh, one of the things. So, so when I came to Dubai, that was in two uh, thousand and sixteen, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, one of the things, so I, I I used to work out in Egypt, um, typical gym environment. Me and my friend, we wake up in the morning, we go, we train together. And then when I came here, I wanted to be part of a community, a fitness community as well. And uh, there was this community that was just starting up. Uh, in 2016 and they were doing uh, Friday boot camps uh, back when the weekends were Friday and Saturday. Uh, and I started going there. It was like a group of like 10, 15 people. Uh, they kept on growing until like on each and every Friday session, it was almost 100 people going, working out together. And then afterwards, they, they used to do it in one gym in, in, uh, in Media City. And then after that, they used to do it in uh, Kite Beach Yeah. when the weather was nice. So we uh, used to do this group exercise and it was so much fun. And then afterwards they went for breakfast and there was the community aspect. COVID came and then this group dismantled and disappeared. So I feel this is something that is needed now. Like people want to go back to 
physical interactions, social, social yeah. seeing each other, working out together, building a community around Really, this, um, yeah, the amount of, because that's huge in Egypt, right? And mm-hmm. the amount of couples I know in Egypt that have actually gotten married from these, uh, from like gotten to know each other initially, or, yeah. and then ended up getting married from these uh, these boot camps and things is, is a lot. I'm sure mm-hmm. you know some as well. So I feel like I was literally, literally just asking someone the other day, where have all these boot camps gone yeah they were huge like you were going i was almost going to go to a few i just never did but mm-hmm. they were huge here in the region and uh and people love them like mm-hmm. just the numbers were insane right so true, true. where where are they uh, and uh the, the, i agree i think that's definitely going to come back big now because mm-hmm. of uh, people craving that social interaction mm-hmm. cool and um uh, Since you have your tutors, and hopefully when they get to listen to this, they're 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 not going to be upset or something. But h- how do you qualify uh, uh, an educator, or how do you um, like what what qualities do you see in an educator that y- you would say okay they can start doing this, and then you want to develop something in them? Yeah. So basically, with our tutors, mm-hmm. uh, they they all have to have, and this is one of the regulations from UK awarding bodies like Active IQ, is they have to have a teaching qualification and they have to have a formal assessing qualification. Okay. So this is something that what we've done, which I think uh, is is uh, is good, is that we haven't, we didn't. Um, look for qualified tutors and assessors that are already out there. Mm -hmm. We say, who's a naturally good teacher, Mm -hmm. naturally good presence, naturally Mm -hmm. caring, naturally going to be an amazing tutor. And we paid for them to do the tutor and assessor qualifications Mm -hmm. because we knew they're already going to be. They um, have the skill. Yeah. And, and, and really, really that, uh, I think makes our team quite special. Uh, they're an amazing bunch of, freelance mostly freelance tutors mm-hmm. we only have one full timer actually but they're they're so loyal mm-hmm. that they they actually really feel like full time um they they're they could teach for other companies but they're not because they they're just really really uh an amazing loyal bunch of uh, tutors that um are already naturally good at teaching and then the the qualification was a formality of course we all learn from any qualification we go on but it, that's i think that's the main thing is not not everybody with the most in-depth knowledge can teach mm-hmm. and you know that right mm-hmm. you, you have to see are they able to actually teach and then they go through the formalities of uh, of the qualification itself i think um is uh, is what the strategy that we took yeah. i think was uh, was a good one looking back nice. now nice nice awesome and um for for aspiring uh, fitness professionals people who are uh, inquiring or or signing up um what would be the number one recommendation you would give anyone who's aspiring to become a fitness uh, professional make fitness first be in your bones yeah <laughs> I don't know if that translates well in English. In Arabic, it makes yeah. sense. But really, Fuck the shit, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to be living and breathing fitness or Pilates or whatever you decide to become before you choose to become an instructor. Mm-hmm. I think that is the most important thing because don't start learning stuff on the course. Like, the, make sure you're, you already, you already have all that. Give yourself time. to really enter the fitness industry as a client, tr- hire different trainers so you know what kind of trainer you want to be, and then go through your qualification. Nice, nice. And and um, uh, if if we should consider this a closing note, um, uh, how would, because you were saying, uh, once they get qualified from uh, Body Hack, uh, this is the start of the journey. Yes. And uh, this is where the real work is. And... Um, There should be continuous learning and continuous education. How would uh, coaches get that? Um, so we are trying to uh, start up a mentorship program that is, the problem is, is once people have finished the diploma, they need to earn. So they can't afford paying for more. Con- we have a lot of amazing courses, mm-hmm. but they're not ready yet to start continuing education right away. They need to actually just enter the industry, work Mm -hmm. for about a year or so, uh, get their return on investment on the diploma, Mm -hmm. and then they need to 
by working with all these different clients, they're going to know what they want to specialize in and what they want to study further. So I think one of the things is some trainers just want to have like all these certificates under their belt and they do it a bit too early without really knowing first what they actually want to get into more. And part of, you know, I feel like so much of my success in this industry has been because I went narrow and deep in the neuro stuff. Mm -hmm. If I had gone a bit everywhere, which was my intention initially, like I'm always grateful to my husband for dragging me to the States, to, 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 to this uh, thing, uh, to the neuro stuff, <laughs> and then just finding my passion there. So, and, and that wouldn't have happened if I'd just done it too early. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think taking time a little bit after the diploma just to implement what you've actually learned, because mm -hmm. people always think there's more to the story. They always say, now I need to do nutrition because all the results are in nutrition. Why don't you try just implementing the basics, the basics of nutrition that you learned? Yep. That you learned And then you'll start to find what the challenges are. And, and, and we're looking for to try and find a mentorship program that doesn't cost the students, mm -hmm. which is difficult because uh, obviously, uh, you know, all the, these freelance trainers that I want them to shadow, uh, the clients might not be happy with them shadowing. And we have so many students and we need to be fair mm -hmm. to everyone. So uh, we're still looking at how the, the details of that are going to work out. But in general, I think take some time in the industry before you start to focus on continuing education, even though it's massively important. And I really want to take this opportunity to thank reps, re the Register of Exercise Professionals, who a lot of people uh, think is not a necessary organization, but for the industry here, they are putting stuff in place that is really keeping things in check, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And nobody appreciates it until they see what's going on in other countries. Mm -hmm. You know, really, the. We think the standard of the industry is so bad here. We all think that. And I know you probably do as well. Mm. But trust me, it's worse in most places. Of course. Because now almost all the certifications you can do fully online. Mm -hmm. No mandatory face-to-face -face days that reps are imposing here. They mm -hmm. have a mandatory set number of face-to-face -face days, which all the training providers have to abide by. It's happening also with Pilates as well. They're having mats as a prerequisite before doing reformer. All over the, uh, the world, people are just getting certified in like two days, you know. Uh, I don't know if it's all over the world, but like the big you know, industries, mm -hmm. uh, the, the standard is going so down because of the unregulation. And I really feel like uh, reps is uh, is holding the region a bit more, uh, you know, to a to, higher to, to, to a certain level, which uh, yeah. which which I think is, is uh, the right way to go about it as well. Yeah. Uh, Heba, thank you uh, so much for your time today. And I I, uh, I think we, we, we talked about a lot and, and there's a lot of uh, meaty educational uh, content that we we just touched on today uh, so thank you for your time thank you for uh, for coming here I, i know you're you're quite busy and uh, we have to do it again yes thank you so much for having me it was such a pleasure speaking to you today likewise if you like this episode please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell